We are now uh, changing gears to a practitioner panel. Um, and I will go ahead and introduce the, the three people who are on this. So we very intentionally picked um, people to represent locations that are at the forefront of zoning reform, thinking about housing policies. Um, you probably don't need much introduction if you're from Minneapolis. Uh, President Lisa Bender uh, is on the Minneapolis City Council, and she was instrumental in a lot of the organizing and development of the Minneapolis 2040 plan. Minneapolis, it, it seems like by the day or by the week, is adopting new housing plans, so there's a new inclusionary zoning. <laughs> I understand there's some tenant protections, there's some rent regulation, so it, it's difficult to keep up with all the things going on, um, but Minneapolis is obviously at the forefront of a lot of this um, and has really taken a national uh, position, um, so lots of other cities are watching. And we're going to hear a little bit from Lisa about the Minneapolis plan and what they've been doing. Um, next to her is Madeline Kovacs. Madeline works for the Sightline Institute, which is based out of Portland, Oregon. Um, and she has been involved for many years in various capacities working on some of Oregon's statewide land use. Um, so for those of you who are not zoning geeks, Zor Oregon this past spring passed both a statewide rent regulation law and something like Minneapolis 2040 allowing uh, small apartment buildings by right in much of the state. Um, and she's going to tell us about that. And then to my immediate right is uh, Bob Duffy. Bob is the uh, chief planner for Arlington County, Virginia, close to where I live. Um, and Arlington is one of the earliest uh, and probably most successful examples of transit-oriented development, so has done really enormous amounts of upzoning and increased housing supply in the immediate vicinity of metro stations. And of course, um, Arlington now gets the other challenge, which as you may have heard, Amazon <laughs> is opening a new headquarters on the border between Arlington and Alexandria. And so it's possible there may be a need for some additional housing to accommodate Amazon's workers. Um, and this is now landed on Bob's desk as well. Um, so we're going to have about 10 minute presentations from each of the panelists to give us some background on their jurisdiction. Um, then we'll do a moderated Q&A and there will be a chance for you guys to ask questions at the end of it. Um, so I think we're going to start with Lisa. Oh, great. I'm going to go up here. Thanks everyone. I'm Lisa Bender. I'm the president of the Minneapolis City Council. And I don't know what I'm doing to move things. Is this the thing? The green button. Okay. Ah, the play button. Okay. So I am going to spend 10 minutes talking about the politics of how we are approaching housing affordability, stability, and all of the related issues in Minneapolis. So I'm not going to be able to tell you everything. Uh, I want to stick to the 10 minutes so we have time for discussion because the last panel's discussion was so interesting and it feels very indulgent for me to get to spend an afternoon with all of you talking about housing economics. Um, I spend a lot of my evenings um, at neighborhood meetings talking to folks who are really scared about change in their community. I've had the experience of taking votes on thousands of new housing units in our city and then going door to door and knocking on folks' doors and asking them to vote for me and to trust me with the future of our city. And unless you've had those experiences, I think it's hard to understand how much that emotion and how much those fears really play into what we need to collectively do uh, to build the case for the kinds of changes we want to see in our community. And honestly, how much I think we have to authentically listen to and honor the experiences of multiple voices in our community. So in Minneapolis, we have strong neighborhood identity. You might be from Minneapolis, but you know what neighborhood you live in. And there's a cultural identity. There's a value. There's a love for where you live that feeds into that pride and into that fear. And this is true across our community in our lowest income neighborhoods and our highest income neighborhoods. Um, we just passed this big plan. It's been in the news. As Minnesotans, we don't always love to be in the news, and I don't think it helps our constituents. Um, they don't really care what the New York Times wants to say about our zoning code. Uh, but they, <laughs> uh, we did just allow up to three units of housing everywhere in the city on every city lot. A typical lot is 40 feet by 100 feet in Minneapolis. Um, the zoning change that will implement that will come in about a month, and it will pass the city council. Um, our plan, um, that is one aspect of a really holistic plan that focuses growth near transit. That continues a pattern we've had for a long time. For the past six or seven years, we've had a billion dollars of real estate investment every year in our city. We are growing. Um, and so this really reinforces that idea of growing near transit. Um, there are 100 policies in our plan. For the first time ever, we adopted a built form map that is really pretty specific about the size and particularly the height of buildings. So we're trying out this new approach and it is shifting a culture which was highly focused on 
individual review of individual projects, many of which were voted on by the city council because they were appealed through our appeal process because they needed a rezoning or many variances to a more of a predictable uh, development market with predictable regulations that are citywide. It's a big culture change for everyone. Our city is growing. We've had a very low rental vacancy rate for a number of years. It may be a little higher now. It's hard to find housing in our city at all levels of income. And this is um, in Minneapolis, like in many cities across the country, uh, our renter and ownership status is very dis um, disparate based on race. 70% uh, of, of our black households are renters. Uh, people of color are more likely to be renters. And this is, of course, based on many reasons, but in our experience and in other cities, it is tied directly to a history of redlining and racial exclusion in housing, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, you know, we have a problem of affordability. We do still have a lot of affordable housing in our market. 60% AMI is still available. We're losing it every day. Uh, we're working very hard to preserve it and to balance that in with all the other things that we are doing. But again, cost burden status in our community is heavily influenced and tied to race. So Minneapolis is a really great place to live, but we have some of the biggest racial disparities in the country. And that's why I'm talking about it so much and why we talked about it so much during this multi-year planning process. We did not shy away from this issue when we talked about the future of our city. We had community meetings all across the city where we showed maps of redlining. Uh, in our community, we had people put pins in their homes to see where they fell in that pattern. We had a local college called Augsburg College who provided information about mapping racially restrictive covenants that said you couldn't own a home if you were black or Jewish or Asian based on your race. We mapped those and compared our redlining map, our racial exclusion, uh, the racially restrictive covenants, and our zoning code, and they lined up. So it is the way that Minneapolis, like many cities across the country, codified racial exclusion in housing. And we don't think we want to do that anymore. So while we know that zoning is just one of the very many tools we will have to use to address that historic racial inequality that goes back hundreds of years, uh, we felt that this was one of the very uh, like sort of least things we could do. The step zero is to eliminate that um, racial exclusion in our zoning code. We did a lot of engagement, and I think the most important thing to talk about from Minneapolis is two things. First, we had very supportive and aligned advocacy organization across a spectrum of advocacy issues, from transportation to racial justice to YIMBYs who created a new organization called Homes for All to organize people specifically to support new housing in our community, traditional housing advocates, all really not, all came together basically aligned along this general vision. Our environmental advocacy community, the Sierra Club in Minneapolis, supported the Minneapolis 2040s plan, general vision and direction. And so we didn't have that competing from organized advocacy groups that we see in so many cities across the country. That is, That was intentional. That took work from, from policymakers, from staff, from advocacy leaders to talk with each other. One of the most interesting moments for me in my six years so far in office was when we had young race justice advocates who were coming out of the Black Lives Matter movement, Matter movement, who were really active after Jamar Clark was killed by Minneapolis police, a young black man that got national attention in 2015. Uh, they came to ask us to divest from the police department and rethink policing. And they listened to the affordable housing advocates talking about how we wanted to, they wanted us to invest more in affordable housing. And then they reached out and sat down together. And then the next time we had a public hearing a month later, their messages were aligned. They were saying the same thing to the council, which is that we believe in a holistic approach to public safety that includes investment in affordable housing. So that is where political support comes from, is from a grassroots organizing that looks at election cycles, that looks at public hearings, and looks at every opportunity that your elected leader are taking a hard vote and, and is there to have those people's back. Because moving a city in the way that we've moved Minneapolis takes political leadership. It takes folks like me sticking our necks way out. And we can only do that if people have our backs and are there you know, to come knock on the doors with us and have those thousands of tough conversations in the next election cycle. And that is happening in Minneapolis. That is why we're getting so much done. We're stealing ideas from all over the country. right? We're taking all your ideas. Uh, but we are in a political moment here that was built intentionally and that I feel very strongly that we have to work intentionally to maintain. Um, so 
quick process takeaways and then I have one final thought on that. So in Minneapolis to pass this big, huge plan um, really was very sweeping. It has climate change goals, um, very focused on race equity, economic development, land use, transportation. Um, we were very clear that we were going to do community engagement differently from the beginning. So the Minneapolis City Council voted on our community engagement strategy and we said, these are the things we want staff to do. We want you to go reach out to cultural communities. We want you to go to community festivals and meet people where, they, where they are. We want you to ask open-ended questions like how do you get around our community and what is it like to find housing? And we don't want you to go to every single neighborhood organization in the city and ask the 10 folks who are at the table what zoning they want on their block, right? And we had to be like, we had to be that, we had to be clear about that. And then we had to have staffs back when they did that and they came back to us with a bold vision. And we have a couple staff here in the room, Danielle, who we heard from earlier, Andrea Brennan's our housing director. We have incredible smart staff leaders all of whom put together this great uh, vision and plan, and now we're all working hard to implement it. Uh, we brought our votes through incrementally, so we passed vision and values, we focused on goals, the city council marked up the goals, we were able to keep it high enough level so that we weren't arguing over like commas and punctuation, which I actually, that happened once on, at a council meeting in my tenure, <laughs> but not about this plan. And only then, after we had taken multiple votes on layers, focused on values and vision, did we take a vote on our land use plan, on our goals, I mean, on the specifics implementing our goals. Um, and again, we were very focused on race equity. Even throughout the three years that we did our community engagement for this plan, the theme of climate change emerged so much more strongly at the end. I think every person who was younger than me who spoke at our public hearings spoke so very passionately about climate change, basically begging us to do some do more um, to fight climate change. And the final plan passed 12 to one. Um, we adopted our inter interim inclusionary zoning policy. Uh, we have a triplex ordinance ready to go and our inclusionary zoning policy will be ready in December or so. So those votes will be coming in the next month so you can keep reading about us in the news. Um, I do think, I think I wanna take my last 20 seconds and say this. Um, the politics of these kinds of efforts are complicated. And I think there's multiple paths for a city to negotiate growth. Um, but I think you have to sort of pick one, right? And in Minneapolis, we picked making sure that we were centering race equity and economic inclusion in the center of our plan. That can't be an asterisk in our implementation. We can't upzone our whole city and then three years later come back and try to figure out how to incorporate race equity. We made a promise to our constituents that we were going to do a better job of planning for race equity from the beginning, of taking on centuries of economic policies, not just on the housing market, on the income side, as everyone has said, the income side in Minneapolis is way more stark. Households of colors, incomes have dropped dramatically in the last 50 years, way more than housing has gone up. But we promised our constituents that we were going to tackle those issues. Uh, so we have to deliver, right? That we were, people were actually gonna see infrastructure improvements in their communities. That when we say we wanna grow near transit, we can't just go back to our constituents and say, the legislature won't give us money to build transit, so sorry, maybe it will come in 10 years. We have to deliver on the whole of our promise. And it's hard and it's going to take creativity, but I will tell you this, I think we will lose the political um, coalition that we've had here if we break that promise. And I think that, again, I think the stories are different in each of our cities, but when we say to our constituents, uh, we hear you and we understand this is what you want, we have to deliver on all of it as best we can. So that is our story in probably 11 minutes. Uh, so I apologize and thank you very much. <laughs>
that we've used historically to guide growth, and most importantly, the community engagement package and programs that we continually revise in Arlington to ensure that we make a difference. And again, how that planning work that we produced and some of those zoning strategies and engagement strategies are now being affected uh, by uh, the, the advent of Amazon HQ2, and I'll talk a little bit about where we are there. But most importantly, housing Arlington. Uh, and what we are about, we were, we've embarked on in terms to address affordability and housing production. So just a little bit about Arlington, our regional location. Uh, we're in a region of six million residents, about three million jobs, about 1,200 uh, square miles of urban area. Arlington's just across the Potomac from the District of Columbia. Historically, we were part of the district. Uh, again, one of the smallest counties in the country, 26 square miles. Today, we have a population of just about 240,000 uh, and about uh, 231,000 jobs. Uh, central to uh, Arlington and to our planning are the two metro corridors. Uh, the corridor that runs from Roslyn out to Boston with Boston with five metro stations, and the corridor that runs from uh, Boston, not Boston, but Roslyn south through Crystal City and Pentagon City, the blue line, and connects us with National Airport. Those two corridors make up 11% of the county, but 42% of our housing units today through very careful planning. In terms of planning, just a quick overview on uh, what uh, Arlington's accomplished in terms of adopting a comprehensive plan, a general land use plan, uh, back in the 1960s, then revising that plan as we move forward uh, with planning for the Metro Corridor. So we have a broad growth strategy, management strategy, our general land use plan uh, that we manage and maintain. But each of our Metro stations has a, an area of about a half a mile, a coordinated redevelopment district that's guided by a sector plan that shapes the form, use mix, types of investment, capacity issues, and the types of uh, public investments that will be necessary. And that informs our capital improvement program and our zoning ordinance. And we've been recognized nationally for our commitment to those levels of planning. But it doesn't stop with planning. And the tool that has been most effective for Arlington County for well over four decades uh, is an incentive-based zoning approach. Uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia is a Dillon's Rule state, so we don't have home rule authority. And so all the rights uh, come from Richmond in terms of uh, what we can do with planning and zoning. So there is an incentive-based zoning statute that uh, Arlington has utilized that sets out a three-tier approach uh, to, to uh, develop it, review, and approval. It's a buy right project level. We have a basic site plan that enables additional density consistent with our general land use plan. But we also allow for bonus density uh, consistent with county goals and policies to, again, advance housing affordability as well as uh, community facilities. That additional bonus density or that increment of additional growth is intended to mitigate and be the nexus to how we implement plans and provide for infrastructure and related improvements. Central to all of Arlington's County, and this do goes back to the 70s when uh, we first began to plan for Metro, and it deals with the importance of community engagement. Uh, every planning effort that Arlington undertakes today uh, starts with a community engagement plan that's part of our scope of work part of our work program. And it focuses on uh, a number of key aspects, including values, certainly equity, and other features. Uh, we have a deliberate process that we go through and we shape uh, with each planning effort. So historically, Arlington has used its ability to plan and to zone to the fine growth within 11% of our county within these metro quarters. And this image, I think, looking uh, east towards the capital uh, from Boston, down the Boston-Ralston corridor, you can see the low density areas to the side, and I've just 
done something? No. Uh, that uh, today, uh, while it's been highly successful, uh, presents a number of challenges that we're trying, we'll need to face. And some of those we can discuss this afternoon. Uh, with the advent of, of Amazon HQ2, while it was the jobs and the potential for employment uh, within the region that shaped and influenced Amazon's decision, it was also Arlington County's planning for Pentagon City and Crystal City that uh, really made a difference and was one of the influences uh, for uh, ultimately selecting Arlington. Uh, I think all of you have read about the number of jobs, 25,000 jobs over a 10-year period. A number of incentives certainly were developed by the Commonwealth and uh, by Arlington County. Uh, and again, uh, that has a housing issue that uh, we'll talk about a bit more. Uh, Arlington's comprehensive plan uh, now includes a affordable housing master plan that was developed uh, in 2015. And you can see from the chart in the right-hand corner, uh, when we started that planning effort two years ago, uh, there was a significant and marked decrease in the amount of market rate affordable units that Arlington had to address. While we were slowly uh, providing for additional uh, uh, certified affordable units for a number of housing programs, including our Affordable Housing Trust Fund and our Bonus Density Program, uh, it was essential that Arlington add an element to its comprehensive plan to uh, address the affordable housing need. Uh, to implement that plan, this spring, the county board adopted a program that's multifaceted that we're calling Housing Arlington. And it's currently involved in a number of strategies, including a broader community conversation that's focused on a number of key areas uh, that deal with how we can partner with institutions in Arlington County uh, what are the land use changes and strategies that we need to develop, including some new zoning strategies? One of the incremental changes that we recently put in place just four months ago was a new accessory dwelling unit ordinance that modified our zoning regulations. I think it's one of the most progressive in the Washington region. And the 27,000 lots in our low density R districts now can have attached, detached, and garden apartments by right, without uh, a use permit or other form of approval other than building code requirements. We've also done some work to enable over 2,000 single family uh, units to make improvements where those units are non-conforming uh, to enable, uh, again, uh, additional households in that part of our housing stock. Uh, we also have embarked on what we're calling a program uh, to establish housing conservation districts. Our county board last year uh, amended our general land use plan to define 12 housing conservation districts where many of our market rate affordable units were at risk, uh, and either through rent or through condo conversion or demolition for townhouse units, uh, we needed to put a mechanism in place to recognize that a new zoning tool was necessary for that. And we've adopted the policy and now we're working towards uh, some new zoning legislation there. Uh, so we're working on really a six-prong approach to housing Arlington that uh, implements our affordable housing plan, but also uh, addresses a real need for change in how we deal with land use planning, how we deal with housing, and community engagement continues to be a central part of that. So that is a broad and uh, uh, overview of uh, Arlington's planning, zoning, and engagement uh, work to date. And I'll look forward to some questions and discussions. Thank you. tilt this down a good nine inches. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. I'm really honored to be speaking in front of you all. Uh, I give a lot of community presentations and do a lot of work with advocates and allies and organizations. And I have to say, 
It's really rare that I'm one of the least wonky people in the room, so this is like a real treat for me. This is pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say that Sightline's based in Seattle, but we are quickly taking over Portland with now four full-time staff in Portland, which is three more than we had this time last year. Um, so my name is Madeline Kovacs. I'm our Senior Outreach Associate, and I'm here to talk about um, not all of the contributing factors to passing HB 2001, but to get into a few key contributing factors to passing HB 2001. So HB 2001, this last legislative session in Oregon, was the bill that we like to say re-legalized missing middle housing across the state of Oregon. So what did it do? In a nutshell, HB 2001, uh, cities, under HB 2001, cities must allow up to four plexes in all neighborhoods, and that's specified in the bill as areas, um, that allow a single family home for cities um, 25K people and above and throughout the Portland metro region. There are about 27 cities within the Portland metro. Um, and then it legalizes duplexes on every lot where a, single, a detached single dwelling uh, home is allowed um, in cities with over 10,000 people. So that's, that's a statewide up zone. That is statewide legalization of middle housing. Um, the bill also does some other very important things in there, like eliminating um, minimum on-site parking for ADUs, um, and voiding future a HOA covenants banning middle housing in the future. We weren't able to do it retroactively, but there, there are some more important components of the bill. But in a, in a gist, uh, 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 that's it. So why did Oregon pass HB 2001? Again, I'm going to go through a few of the reasons. We'll talk about more of the reasons probably when I get up there. Uh, 40 years of statewide uh, uh, land use. Portland's residential infill project, we learned a lot of both policy lessons, precedents, organizing tactics, communication. There were a whole bunch of lessons learned in the Port Portland metro areas. Portland was working on their infill plan. Uh, legislative precedents, I'll just touch on 2017, but this clearly goes back a lot longer. And leadership from the affordable housing community was huge. So first, uh, this is an article published by my colleague Michael Anderson on Sightline. I actually highly recommend um, that you read it. If you're a history buff or you're just into land use, um, Oregon is really exceptional in its early adoption of a statewide land use planning program um, in the United States. So back in 1973, under Republican uh, Governor Tom McCall, Oregon passed SB 100. And that did a number of things. So it established a statewide land use planning uh, program with, at the time, 14 statewide planning goals. There are now 19, including natural resource protection, uh, infrastructure, coastal protection, and housing. And I'm just going to flip <clears throat> and read you one sentence in the top of housing goal. Uh, goal, goal 10 is housing. It, this, is a, this is a goal. Plans shall encourage the availability of adequate numbers of housing units at price points at price ranges and rent levels, which are commensurate with the financial capabilities of Oregon households and allow for flexibility of housing location, type, and density. That has been technically on the books as a goal for every city in Oregon to meet since 1973. Implementation clearly gets a little bit more tricky. We do have a housing crisis, but the other thing that uh, SB 100 did was it established a comprehensive planning process. So in Oregon, every 20 years or, you know, depending on um, when the process is triggered, cities and counties have to go, go through a comprehensive planning process where they're supposed to do a uh, housing needs analysis. They're supposed to do a buildable lands inventory, right? Um, accommodating housing for, to house all, your whole community affordably is supposed to have been part of the plan from the beginning. And the precursor to that bill um, was another bill <laughs> that was passed in 1969. In the 1960s nationwide, we were starting to talk about the effects of exclusionary zoning, both racially exclusive zoning and also the effect that uh, the exclusivity of some single dwelling uh, zoning was having on our ability to house people. Um, and so cities in Oregon were, uh, so Oregon was one of the, the, the only states to really respond with a statewide plan that kind of kick-started that comprehensive planning process, which eventually led to SB 100. So the point is that we've been talking about exclusionary zoning for a long time. Now, over the past 40 years, right, local jurisdictions have written rules because they don't want to add housing and 
there are lots of reasons not to. And so there's been this back and forth. Uh, we really owe a lot of our success to 1,000 Friends of Oregon, which is a statewide land use nonprofit watchdog group um, that does its best to safeguard and strengthen those rules and to bring cities further in compliance with meeting our statewide planning goals. Um, but we have had this back and forth, and not all cities are in compliance. Um, and so HB 2001 really is the first uh, huge step in about over 30 years on um, desegregating neighborhoods uh, by income and housing type. Another important factor, oh, and I, I should say, the reason this was so important to passing HB 2001 is because in Oregon, we had opposition from local jurisdictions, but it did not have the force or the weight that it does have in some other states that don't have this long history of land use planning and requiring local jurisdictions to meet these statewide goals. It's more of a precedent in Oregon, so the conversation looks a little bit different. Um, we learned a lot of lessons. Uh, I was also um, an organizer with Portland for Everyone for two and, two and a half years, and we learned some lessons about how to talk to people about zoning. So we learned that it is better um, to, um, uh, Council, Member Bender's, uh, Council President Bender's point, to kind of try to meet people where they're at, but also to lead with a more holistic approach to housing, right? Just rezoning isn't going to get us where we need to go. We need to talk about exclusionary zoning. We need to talk about physical accessibility. One of our greatest partners was actually AARP. We went on walking tours of middle housing with AARP. It was kind of a show, not tell. So we would walk through a streetcar neighborhood that had, that had been um, constructed more during the streetcar era that had duplexes, internally converted homes, small courtyard apartments. And we would just go through and talk about the housing types and how they could meet different price points and serve people's needs. And then at the end, we would say, oh, and by the way, this is more than three times the density that this area is now zoned for if it burned down and we rebuilt it with single dwelling homes. And these are beautiful neighborhoods that are some of the most desirable in Portland, but it was important to walk through with people and talk about some of their other goals and then get to density and housing price points because they're, we're going to have a generation of boomers that we're going to have to house accessibly and um, incumbent owners, homeowners in Portland tended to be our greatest opposition. But finding those ways where you can talk to people, where you're kind of meeting them where they're at, and you're talking about a more holistic suite of solutions that the zoning is gonna help meet can really open the door, the door to other conversations. Um, we also did one thing, uh, we learned to talk about re-legalizing housing types as opposed to banning single dwelling zoning. That was something that we did at Portland for Everyone, which was run by a thousand Friends of Oregon. That was something that we did at Sightline. And I think it really helped because it, it, the, whole, the whole idea is to open up housing choices and housing options. And the whole idea is to, do, is to be providing housing choices for people. And so that uh, reframe and messaging was something that we had done at the Portland level and that translated up to the state when we um, went for HB 2001. Um, another reason I should point out that the Portland experience was so influential was because Portland does have a very big presence at the legislature. We're also only a half an hour away by train. And so our opposition and our support looked very similar. So we just had practice having that conversation and turning people out. It worked in our favor. Uh, last, uh, so there were some bills in 2017, again, to council member, um, uh, Bender's point, this Speaker Kotek, the uh, Speaker of the House in Oregon, deserves incredible credit for bringing back bills a second time uh, in 2019 and also putting forward a holistic housing solution suite that was addressing different parts of the problem and, and appealed to different sets of housing advocates. So we really all felt like we had something there. And even if we didn't have rah-rah support from anti-displacement and community stability activists, at worst it was tacit agreement um, because, um, and so in 2017, HB 2004 would have banned no cause evictions and lifted the statewide ban on rent control. That failed, but SB 608 came back and that passed two months before the zoning bill HB 2001 was even up. So that, that box had been checked. Um, we also had a precursor to HB 2007, or sorry, to HB 2001, which was HB 2007. That would have legalized duplexes across the state, 
um, in 2017. That got scaled back to accessory dwelling units. There were also some other important pieces of that bill. It was a, HB 2007 was much more aggressive. Uh, so SB 1051 did pass. So again, eight accessory dwelling units were legalized statewide uh, two, uh, two years before we got to HB 2001. So that precedent again had been set and the speaker came back and said, we're just gonna do even more. And then lastly, I promise, uh, leadership from affordable housing. So again, talking about that whole solution spectrum, um, some of the biggest advocates for the rezoning bill were the Oregon Housing Alliance, which is 90 mostly nonprofit um, affordable housing organizations that you know work from homelessness to first-time home ownership. And they really came out in front and worked with us and just worked themselves to educate legislators on how the rubber hits the road for uh, their organizations and for their projects. Because when they can't right, subdivide a lot and they have time costs and delays, that is, this impacts them too. Um, one of the best interviews um, on OPB, Oregon Public Broadcasting, was with the uh, president of Habitat for Humanity Portland East, where he was talking about, we've also been priced out of single family homes. We need to share land costs. We're building townhomes and duplexes and triplexes to serve families at the 30% to 60% median family income. That's what we need. That's what we need more of. And so having them out saying that and working in conjunction with people working on zoning reform um, was incredibly powerful. And I will stop there. Oh! Those were, um, those were great presentations. And uh, yesterday when I was on the plane, I was reading through um, Bob's slides and Lisa's slides and writing down notes. Um, so I could probably ask questions for three hours of you guys, um, but I won't do that. So I'm gonna focus on a couple of things. One thing that struck me, um, Madeline and Lisa, that both of you brought out um, was that you, were, you didn't start with zoning. You didn't walk in and say, we're gonna legalize duplexes, we're gonna legalize quadplexes. You started with broader goals. Um, and Bob, you talked about this a little bit in Arlington too, that some of this was around originally around the uh, providing the metro and now there's a new employer coming in. Mm -hmm. That's sort of an interesting, from, from the academic economists, we tend to focus on there's a problem, we ban multifamily buildings. If we change the ban <laughs> on multifamily buildings, that that will fix it. And it sounds to me like what you're saying is when you go talk to people, that you have to lead with something that's larger than just the policy tool. How important do you think was that to the changes you were able to get through? I can jump in. We, you know, we did both. So in my first term in office, I chaired the Zoning and Planning Committee, and we took an in incremental approach to policies that set us up to have a bigger conversation in the 2040 plan that was really very values driven and very high level. So we legalized accessory dwelling units. In order to do that, we had seven community meetings all over the city, and we answered a lot of questions that were about parking and noise and density and people looking in my backyard from their ADU and um, but AARP was there and you know it was the we had a lot of the advocates who came in the end on this much bigger vision there at that you know early conversation we reformed parking eliminating parking requirements for uh, completely for 50 units and below near transit and having them f we were we went from one to 0.5 for bigger buildings. So we had made some of those changes and tiptoed into the conversations in community and then came back and did a big vision. Mm -hmm. I think for us uh, at, the, at the local level, starting with residential infill and then moving up to HB 2001, um, in Portland it was really interesting because, so the residential infill project's inception was in September of 2015 and it's still moving forward slowly. It's gonna pass, it's gonna be amazing, it's getting better with every round. Um, <laughs> I mean it, but, um, but what was interesting there was staff was, uh, it, part of their, it was, again, it was, a, it was an implementation project of the comprehensive plan update, so it's one of many rezoning projects and other projects moving through the city. And staff have been hearing a lot from neighbors about parking, about demolitions, about skinny houses or narrow lot homes, uh, 25 or, or less is our definition, and they had been hearing um, a lot about lack of housing affordability. So staff had put together this platform that addressed kind of a lot of more of the form. And I think that they didn't think that this was gonna be quite as incendiary as it was. But then the advocates, we got involved and we started convening the Portland for Everyone Coalition. And that was made up of 
um, affordable housing developers, some neighbor neighborhood associations, um, people who are concerned about climate or transit access and walkability. So it was a very diverse group, um, some builders, getting together and basically saying, well, we think we can push this a lot further because here are our values. And um, AARP came to the table and was like, we want to talk about physical accessibility. We want to talk about the benefits of ADUs for aging in the community. Uh, tree advocates wanted to talk about in, you know, per impervious services, right? So this, it changed, and what Portland ended up doing was coming up with um, also an incremental bonus approach, where now in the project, um, basically they reduced the FAR allowed for single dwelling home from the 6,700 square feet for one home, affectionately called a McMansion now, down to 2,500 square feet, which is still above the average home size in Portland. But every time you add another unit, you get, you get more size. So I think it's 500 uh, square feet per unit up to three, and then four by right, you don't get the, you don't get the addition. But there's also a bonus system for um, regulated affordable housing. So you give um, nonprofit developers a competitive advantage, and you also hope that you're going to create more mixed income projects. Um, and we're still looking at the details, and advocates are still working with staff to try to figure out what that is. But that's a values-led frame where you took the box that the proposal was in and said, what about this box instead? And what if these are our goals? Um, because more housing is a benefit and more affordable housing is a benefit and mixed income communities are a benefit. What would it look like to get there? And so we're still having that conversation. In Arlington, um, historically, uh, again, with our commitment to community engagement, uh, a planning process involving an update to our comprehensive plan or the development of the affordable housing master plan uh, involves a two-year effort. And uh, an implementation program was developed, approved by the county board. And we realized early that while engagement was going to be, continue to be extremely important and essential, we had, to, we had to find ways to seek early implementation or early action steps. What could we do incrementally as well as long term to make a difference and make progress on this deficit of housing units, uh, both uh, in some cases uh, for low and moderate income, but also for what planners call the missing middle. And so we selected several uh, zoning changes that we were able to process in under a year, and again, that dealt with the accessory dwelling unit provision of the ordinance, the two-family uh, provision of the ordinance. Uh, we recognized that our zoning regulation, how it provided opportunities for seniors, uh, was also woefully out of date. And so we divided that into several phases and began to develop new zoning regulations to stimulate housing production there. Uh, and so we, we've looked at our work program and our engagement approach as not only incremental, but building towards a much bigger goal. And so far, it, it's paying off. But again, uh, it is a change in terms of Arlington's historic commitment to constraining growth within that 11% of the county within those metro corridors. And it's putting pressure on the edges and pressure in many of our, our neighborhoods for some of the reasons you heard in the first panel. Uh, but again, I think the urgency is there and Arlington is adapting to that. So picking up on that point, um, there's sort of a difference between the Arlington approach and both Minneapolis and Oregon, which is that Arlington has done this targeted increase in housing around transit corridors and then very high densities along some of those. Um, but has largely exempted the single family neighborhood. So in the map you showed, you know, you go from really dense, very tall buildings to single family detached homes with yards mm -hmm. in a very short space. Um, whereas Minneapolis intentionally went with a citywide approach and Oregon's also, you know, affects all of the residential neighborhoods. Leaving aside sort of the, the policy implications, which one of those would work better? Are there political pros and cons for saying we're going to do a citywide approach, every residential neighborhood gets a change, versus just trying to target certain neighborhoods? Does that change who's going to be in support, who's going to be opposed, how hard it is to get something passed? Just to talk about the Arlington approach, and this is going back in history a bit towards the 70s and 80s, uh, when the metro uh, system was being planned. The orange line that runs east and west from Roslyn to Boston at the time Metro planned it, it was going to be constructed 
than the median of I-65. If you've been to Washington, you've traveled the Orange Line, the Silver Line, you'll be traveling along Interstate Highway. Arlington's leadership made a decision that we had an opportunity to relocate that towards uh, the, uh, to, uh, to a number of our really failing commercial centers uh, in, in Roslyn, out through Boston, and that would present a significant opportunity. The politics of that were extremely difficult because of the neighborhoods, because of a number of other factors. But ultimately, leadership uh, took the position that, that ultimately this would pay off. But it led to a compact with the neighborhoods that that density would occur within those lines. And if you look at our general land use plan, you will see that there are black lines on that map called coordinated redevelopment districts, and that they are about a half a mile uh, from the center of each metro station, and that is the limits of that higher intensity growth. That was a successful strategy, 70s, 80s, 90s, but today, looking for opportunities for uh, residents of access to housing beyond those lines mm -hmm. uh, requires us to rethink some of that compact. And uh, that's requiring a new uh, sense of urgency and a new outreach strategy that uh, we're, uh, we're undertaking. But again, while we look at the larger picture of changing possibly elements of that compact, allowing some additional density beyond the corridors, we're also taking initial steps incrementally to introduce that density in ways that we think deals with the environmental character of the neighborhoods uh, in a way that starts us down a road that, uh, that will take some time. Do you want to go next? Um, yes. <laughs> um, so a few different multifaceted answers to that very quickly. One is that yes, it absolutely changes the conversation about what people say they want and where they say they want it. Um, again, starting in Portland and moving up. In Portland, it was very interesting because again, the residential infill project, which is the rezoning project for single dwelling detached neighborhoods, um, was kind of the last in a series of rezoning projects. And a lot of neighbors felt like they had, the city was telling them, okay, 80% of growth is gonna occur in the central city and along our centers and corridors, but that still leaves 20%. So I think people felt like they didn't have to worry and then they had to worry and they felt kind of uh, like they'd been getting mixed messages, even though I disagree with that interpretation, but that's how people felt. Um, there is another piece of it, which is the reason that HB 2001, something like that, statewide planning is necessary, because it's not only the hot potato between neighborhoods, the hot potato like between cities statewide. We had some cities that were really stepping up and looking at their zoning codes and trying to figure out you know, how to make their neighborhoods more mixed income, welcoming duplexes, welcoming affordable housing, and then other cities that just want, it's mostly wealthier suburban cities, they wanted absolutely none of it. And they're not necessarily required to do something unless we you know, take statewide action or enforce goal 10. So that was really interesting. There's also a broader context here where I think Portland, we tend to think of ourselves as good liberals and a lot of the opposition to HB 2001 actually came from legislators representing wealthier liberal districts in Portland. And it was really interesting because the conversation uh, over the past four years, we've done a lot of unpacking of our privilege in Portland. And a lot of the Fair Housing Council of Oregon had Richard Rothstein come speak. Fair Housing Council is now partnering with the Bureau of Planning Sustainability, sort of like a couple years behind where Minneapolis was in terms of putting it out front, but doing some education with neighborhood associations um, kind of around the city to try to enrich that conversation. Like these are our values and this is where we need to go and how we're gonna do it. Um, but it's been really interesting watching these liberal neighborhoods. And for some of it, I don't blame people for, and then some of it, we just have to have this conversation and people need to uh, be part of the solution. Um, they're fine with affordable housing in general, or they're fine with density in general, or they're fine with whatever in general, and then you talk about their block and everything changes. And I think people feel very put upon and they, they just haven't had to make these trade-offs, because in Portland, you know, we've been able to have it both ways. So I think, 
some of it is just education and some people are going to be able to embrace things differently and look at things differently and others won't. Others are genuinely concerned about some of the impacts of development that we talked about earlier. So trying to have more benefits agreements or have kind of the value added with that development and make it in line with our values. And then um, a third thing is um, talk about the benefits of density. So the other thing in East Portland is, you know, East County is not walkable. You know, there's no north-south frequent transit lines. You know, and that area is like zoned with a base level density that didn't have the streetcar environment from our 1920s neighborhoods that we love so much. It's not walkable. So how do we make sure that we are um, talking about density in a way that can actively benefit people in their lives? As w It's not necessarily a burden. It's a burden and a benefit. I'm so inspired by the state leadership we're seeing around the country. So I just, I just like want to ask you 100 questions about these state campaigns. But um, at the city level, I think, you know, again, I think, I think of my job as there's what I value and what my constituents value, you know, what we think is the right thing to do, like what the economists are telling us, what the data shows us, and then what, it, what can I get done? And there's so many lines to get to what can I get done. Um, so for parking reform, we, um, we focused our parking reform ordinance near transit defined as a quarter mile from high frequency bus or a half mile from fixed rail, which is a solid policy. There's a solid policy argument for why you would reduce parking near transit. It is a political map of the city. Um, this was one election ago, so we've had a huge political shift in our city in the last two elections. Um, but at that time in that council, the map of council members who represented wards that were most affected by transit-oriented policy were the ones who supported the policy. And so the ones who were skeptical about reducing parking weren't really as impacted. Um, so it was a political map and a solid policy um, approach. For the comprehensive plan, in Minneapolis, every single council member is elected by, in wards. We don't have any district uh, citywide council elect elected officials. We have a mayor elected citywide, but the policy work really comes through the city council. And so uh, there's probably another line to get where we, go where we got to, but I really think that doing a citywide approach in a city where you have 100% district electeds, you know, was how we were able to do it because we did all hold hands and say, look, we've been growing in 1% of our land area for decades. And my constituents in one of those wards are look around and say, how come we're taking all of the growth? We're already one of the densest neighborhoods in the city and we're not seeing transit improvements. We're not really seeing infrastructure improvements or public benefits coming in a way that they can perceive as coming along with development. So they were feeling frustrated. Um, and so for me as a council member representing a ward that is relatively dense and growing, I could say, well, yeah, we're taking a citywide approach. And for the council members who are in lower density districts, you know, we had to like really support them. I spend a lot of my time in representing a ward that's 80% renter that has duplexes and triplexes and fourplexes, which we tried to pass and didn't, <laughs> didn't pass, um, supporting my colleagues who don't have those things in their wards now. And we had to do that. We really had to work collaboratively and work together. There was a lot of, um, you know, in the details, uh, you know, negotiation for that final map, but we were able to hold that citywide pattern. And I think that was important, again, because of the way that our, even that our, um, you know, our political system is structured. And it occurs to me that the previous panel, you know, a number of uh, questions came up. Historically, lower income neighborhoods, neighborhoods of color have absorbed a lot of the new development and then there's fear of gentrification. And in part because the zoning maps, as we've seen from all of these jurisdictions, the zoning maps essentially protect wealthy white neighborhoods as 100% single family, right? And so in some sense, what you guys are doing with citywide changes mm -hmm. is saying the wealthy white neighborhoods are not of, able to avoid development in the way that they've been doing for 50 years, yeah. right? And that's, I mean, that seems like that's, that's kind of a revolutionary statement. And it's a very controversial one. And uh, so one of the one of the things it was too many layers to put on the slides, and I was already like a minute and a half over. Um, <laughs> in HB two thousand seven, which was the bill that got scaled back into SB ten fifty one in two thousand seventeen, which was the precursor to HB two thousand one. Um, one of the original provisions in that bill, my uh, former supervisor, the deputy director at Thousand Friends, Mary Kyle, worked very long and hard on this. We had Portland neighborhoods, largely the same three neighborhoods, I won't name them, applying for um, historic district status uh, 
So in Oregon, I think we're, I think we're only one of two states where when you establish yourself as a new historic district, it doesn't go through a state level or a local level kind of discretionary process to figure out what that means for that district. It goes straight to SHPO and so, to, or to the National Park Service. And so uh, we had, when they saw the residential infill project coming, we had neighborhoods say, oh, I, we want that. We are going to pay for our own study. Here's the line around the neighborhood. Don't touch it. Here we go. And that came out of the bill in uh, 1051. We're now going through a different process to amend our process to establish a historic district. And the city of Portland is working on, uh, and we're working with the state to try to have some granularity there and some process to, okay, if this is a historic district, writing rules where you can have growth, right? And there's some areas of gray there. Um, but that was a really big fight. And um, yeah, so far they, they haven't been successful. But that was after they tried to down zone through the comp plan. Uh, so anyway, it's a thing. So I, I, I want to um, <laughs> I want to uh, stay on sort of this theme of who is most impacted by the changes and uh, you know how you how you build a broader coalition that gets around some of the traditional NIMBYism, and some of this uh, you know is sort of. All of you talked about the engagement, right? Engagement is really important. And engagement's always a part of planning. So any kind of change goes through engagement. Um, but we know from some really good political science research that when you have community meetings, right? Typically these are held in the evenings. People are supposed to come. There's a period of comment. Neighbors can show up and talk. The people who show up are the people who are opposed to things because they have a strong incentive. Um, and we know from some data that the people who show up at public meetings typically are wealthier, they're whiter, they're older, right? There are a lot of retirees because they have the time to do this. And typically, working families with lots of obligations just don't have the time or don't feel that they can show up. Is there some way that cities can devise community engagement around planning in a way that's less putting the burden on people to take their free time to do this? Mm -hmm. Is there a way to make the planning process more inclusive, not just through this targeted outreach, but just the way we do planning? It's, that is going to be a challenge, I think, uh, in many uh, communities, certainly a challenge in Arlington. I'll just give you one ex example, Jenny. Uh, the site plan, uh, special exception site plan process I talked about that we've used for decades to review uh, major uh, transit-oriented development in our corridors. The Planning Commission plays an integral role in that process. The Planning Commission uh, back in the uh, late 70s, uh, established a, a site plan review committee that's a committee of the whole of the Planning Commission, but also includes representatives from the neighborhood associations, other boards and commissions, uh, and other interested parties. It is a big table, uh, and most of those meetings occur in, in the evening. Uh, and uh, we have tried to I think provide alternative ways while we stream the meetings, provide uh, a number of online uh, opportunities through social media otherwise to, uh, to provide access and, and input into it. It, it. The tradition of it, of having those meetings, is a tough thing to, uh, to, to turn around. Uh, but um, I think Arlington's committed to looking at uh, a wider range of ways to virtually have community meetings, uh, town halls, uh, and other uh, means to fully engage the community. But it is challenging, I think, as we all know, to uh, shift gears. And Lisa, I wanted to ask you in particular, because you guys did a lot of engagement, and you were talking about um, your staff who work for the city council or the housing department or planning? Planning department. But department. it was really a citywide effort. So I. I think we have to change how we do community engagement as planners. I'm a planner as as government, as cities. Um, it's just, we just have to figure out a different way of, of doing things because what we've done for so long isn't working in so many ways. I reached a point in my career, I don't know, a few years ago, where I realized that when I stand up in front of a room and, and, and get screamed at, the, the effect that that is having on my community. So as planners, as elected officials, we have to flip our mindset from how much screaming we can endure to how we create authentic conversations so that people can listen to each other and speak 
from their heart and from their experience so that we can move forward. Because I, I mean, it's not uncommon in my ward that people come to a community meeting and leave crying or that my renters, my young renters who represent 80%, not all young, my renters who represent 80% of my constituents don't feel comfortable speaking because of all of the ways that folks talk about them in front of them during the meetings. I mean, I have people shaking and crying and it, that it's not acceptable and it's my job to create a space where my constituents feel safe and able to be heard. So, um, so that's, I mean, if, if we're gonna do traditional public meetings, it's been my commitment that every person leaves feeling heard and supported. And that means we don't have meetings with a PowerPoint in the front and people with a microphone because it just turns into screaming in my ward. It means we have to have volunteers facilitating small conversations. It means people have to adjust. It means folks don't get to give a speech in front of all their neighbors and throw out all the jargon and the zoning that they've learned and, and have that advantage. Um, but it means that we really are taking the time to try to hear from folks across the board. Um, so I think we have to change how we're thinking about public meetings, but we did, and our staff can follow up, they did such an incredible job. Uh, we have an entire department of community engagement at the city. We spend millions of dollars every year engaging our community. Um, sometimes too much, I think. Sometimes we do it in a way that, because we're having so many meetings about things, you know, smaller, um, detailed things, I think the folks who have the most, it really advantages folks who have more time and more resources. So I'm really mindful of not just more engagement, but better and more inclusive. Um, we had, you know, we had our staff at public festivals, at our open streets events. Uh, we had folks, um, we have cultural staff who are tasked with doing engagement in our cultural communities that have built up trust over time, not on planning issues, but just on every community issue that's facing our city. So we utilized those relationships to have conversations about transportation and housing and economic development in, in common language so that we got folks lived experience. And I think in order for this to be successful, we have to value the lived experience of a woman who's experiencing homelessness in the community um, who may be an intravenous drug user. We have to hear her voice and elevate her experience as much as someone who has a PhD in economics. And if we're not going to, we can't take her time. You know, we can't ask people to come to meetings if we really don't want to hear what it's like to live in our community. We, we really don't want to hear what it's like to try to find housing if you're experiencing um, other issues in your life. And so I think, you know, from the very beginning, we have to have a value of, of valuing and lifting up lived experience. I think one thing that, that we've, uh, we're doing more of, and it's been successful, uh, and again, I think it is difficult to shift gears uh, towards uh, uh, the type of process we've traditionally done, but we do more open houses. We do more opportunities to reach out to the 64 civic associations we have, to have meetings within those neighborhoods at various times of the day uh, to try to engage directly one-on-one uh, -on -one or in groups rather than the standard public hearing process. Uh, it takes a significant amount of time to certainly organize, prepare, to ensure that staff uh, are equipped uh, to lead those discussions, but that is one path that I think uh, we're going to do more of and I think is making a difference and is more inclusive than uh, just the traditional public hearing or uh, community meeting and PowerPoint presentation. I would have something very brief to add to that, both from the advocacy side and um, watching planners. Um, don't assume that someone is interested in coming to your meeting. And like, for example, like, no, I'm serious. But what I, what I mean by that is, um, my friend, uh, a former colleague of mine said it really well one day. We were talking about zoning reform. We were talking, okay, how, how, how low an MFI can we go with this bonus system, right? Okay, well, we can probably get some habitat projects in there serving th people at 30 to 60. More likely, when we're talking about residential infill project zoning, we're talking about predominantly home ownership. We're trying to make sure that pencils for rental, regulated affordable rentals too. But we're probably talking about 60, 60 to 80. So why would someone with an eviction notice in their hand from East Portland come to that meeting to talk about a zoning plan. And it, the planners may be right. In 20 years, making sure that we have enough housing will help. But that's 20 years from now, and I'm standing here with an eviction notice in my hand. So I think it can be um, not just condescending, but like rude to assume that you know what matters to people in that way. And I think you have to ask. And you have to go where people are already at. People are already telling you 
where they want to be, what, what they need. And you need to find those meetings. You need to find where those centers of participation are that are not the power centers um, and do some homework to figure out who you're not hearing from and go and hear from them. Because you will come up with a more holistic policy suite that, that way as well that will actually help you in Portland. Again, like, kind of like bending around. We also passed an anti-displacement policy package in the comprehensive uh, plan in 2015. And that is starting to be rolled in with the residential info project and better housing by design. So it's kind of being treated more as a suite of packages now where one doesn't move without the other. And that's, that's receiving really good feedback, better feedback. I also think we're having some success um, with setting up different community advisory committees on different subject areas. We've had these for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, it takes, there's some growing pains and it takes some setup um, and staff time and, and all of that, but it helps us create a, a group of folks who represent all different, you know, areas of a topic who then, you know, are developing the same expertise at the same time. Um, so I think that's an effective tool. So I'm going to ask one more question for the panel and then throw it open to you guys. You can take some time to start thinking about your questions. Um, I'm curious, since we've got two people from local governments, and Madeline, you've worked both at the city level and at the state level, it takes political guts for a city council member, for a mayor, for a county uh, supervisor to stand up and advocate for something that at least some of their constituencies are going to be upset about, uh, will have financial <laughs> harms from, and you know that they're afraid of the change. So for elected officials to do this, it's hard. Given that a lot of this stuff is going to be passed at the local level, is there something that states could do to give backup to mayors and county supervisors that would make that easier? Is there a way that states can be supporting local governments to help them do things that they want to do? I gotta like scan who's in the room. <laughs> I'll go last. <laughs> Chatham House rules since we're webcast, I don't think that's possible. It's a safe space. Just while you're while you're scanning. I'll just write down my stuff and submit a written uh, statement. One thing that I think it. that was successful with the Amazon experience is that uh, while um, National Landing, as it was branded, and uh, uh, went through the the process leading to the, the formal announcement. Uh, we did a number of, of public meetings, some of them virtual, some of them certainly live at various times. Uh, but we recognized that Amazon was uh, so important for the region. And the Washington Council of Governments helped facilitate a number of very important meetings with a wide range of stakeholders. Uh, Chuck Bean, who's uh, the president of, 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 of Metropolitan Washington COG, uh, did an outstanding job. And I think bringing that regional perspective mm -hmm. in marrying that with the local uh, county board, uh, I think uh, was extremely, extremely valuable. Uh, and um, I think, again, as we move forward with a number of housing initiatives in Arlington and Northern Virginia, that regional connection is going to remain. Mm -hmm. And of course, D.C. is a sort of strange area because there's not one state. It crosses two states plus the district. It's the challenge. We have Maryland, state of Virginia, and certainly the District of, of, of Columbia. Uh, regionalism is a challenge, to say the least. That's a really good question. And um, my answer for this one isn't as great as I would love. But uh, doing something at the state level means you know, all cities must comply. And so on the local level, it takes a lot of pressure off local officials. They're like, well, we have to do this now. In Portland, another sneaky bill that got in there this session was SB 534. So narrow lots, again, largely prodded in uh, eh, predominantly middle, middle to, to wealthier neighborhoods uh, are now legalized to build on. So we're going to have more narrow lots. Um, I think... Um, so that's, that's one thing, it's just giving political cover to locals, but taking that up at the, at the state. Like, th there are no words to describe how much Speaker Kotek deserves leadership for working on SB 608, which was the rent cap increase 7% plus inflation, uh, and putting forward an aggressive, aggressive affordable housing funding agenda, and putting forward zoning reform. Like, she really said, we need to be working on all these levers, and we're just going to do it. Like, she, she did such an amazing job, and her staff was trained, her staff was talking to stakeholders so that they knew how those nuances of the conversation about what they were pro proposing were going to unfold. That wasn't something that they did on the fly. You know, her staff were, were just 
inundated with affordable housing policy. They were ready to talk through every single implementation detail, implementation detail you could imagine. Um, I think one thing that I would like to see more of that I think, I think Oregon has started to do, to do this a little bit, but I know it's expensive to study and it's expensive to find the, the right data, but not housing people is really expensive. And cities bear the, the, the costs of that as well. Um, there was a lot of um, talk about infrastructure costs. HP 2001 did have $3.5 million in implementation funds. Uh, something I should have mentioned about the bill is if cities don't pass their own ordinance in compliance in one year for um, uh, duplexes and then two years for you know, other middle housing, um, there will be a DL DLCD, the Department of Land Conservation Development, will write a model code that cities must then implement. So the state's going through a really interesting experiment right now trying to write a model code that would apply in all these jurisdictions across the state. Um, but I think we need to start quantifying the impacts uh, to our community, both in terms of homelessness, impacts on people's lives, and just the expenses that local governments and our agencies incur uh, by not housing people, because it's huge. Was she in local office before she was in the legislature? She also lived in a fourplex. Yeah, she was. See, <laughs> this is the thing. I mean, I think these leaders who are emerging at the state level in Oregon and California were city council members yeah. before they ran for office, so they understand the politics and how hard it is as a city council member to upzone the neighborhood where you're at the grocery store, your kid's school, and everyone's yelling at you. <laughs> like, you gotta get a little more distance when you're in those state outs, right? Um, I honestly think that cities across the country have been making uh, miscalculation about our own power for a long time and that cities have to start f being less timid about these negotiations that we've been relying on like maybe if we support road funding all across the state they'll give us a little bit of money for transit and maybe if we're not too outspoken about renter protections like rent increase caps like maybe we can get the legislature to support written notification of eviction so you can't evict someone one day after the rent is late and it's not working because we still have, we still don't have transit funding, and we still, you can still get evicted in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, if you're one day late on rent. Uh, so I think that we need to build power across our states. Um, I think cities are leading in the country, and then we need to lead in our in our communities. And I think there's so much synergy. When I talk to my counterparts, who are mostly part time, who don't have staff, who work for, you know, who are are representatives or elected officials in smaller communities, they're having a lot of the same problems. And our politics might sound different, but the problems are not really that different. And so I think there's so much more synergy, and that's why I'm really so inspired by the state movements that are happening, because we are preempted. The, thing, the meaningful things that we could do to answer the questions that my constituents have in Uptown and Minneapolis are so many of those things are blocked or preempted by our state laws. We can't capture the increased value of land that happens after we upzone a property because state law preempts us from doing so. You know, we are super convoluted around our renter protections, but our state laws are some of the worst in the country in, in terms of prioritizing landlords over renters. You know, we were preempted from all kinds of things. And then just huge loss of lack of investment in our infrastructure in growing places which are fueling economic growth statewide. We're a job center, we're a tax base for the state, and I think we just need to advocate for ourselves in a different way, which is more work in some ways, which is you know organizing voters statewide, and that's the next step. <laughs> Well, you can walk across the bridge to St. Paul and have this conversation. Right? Yeah, but we, I mean, we are, we talk, you know, we are, so. Coming next. All right, time for you guys to ask all of the questions. Wow, lots of questions. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, we're going to start oh, with man. Neil and then go with Lawrence. Thank you uh, to President Bender and Madeline, I guess, and uh, and Robert. But start with you to think about the changes with the Minneapolis, uh, the 2040 plan and the changes in Oregon. Do you have a sense, are private developers like ready to go? Are they just waiting for the changes to be put in place? And how fast do you expect to see changes? Or is it going to be more incremental, or is it too hard to know? We have developers ready to go, um, which we know because you know we weren't quite sure when the Metropolitan Council would approve our plan. Um, so we have folks you know ready. In part, they may be trying to avoid our inclusionary zoning ordinance, which is coming in about a month. So we have to see what happens with that. I think the I think the changes along our corridors will come relatively quickly. I think the changes in our single-family neighborhoods will come very slowly. And our accessory dwelling unit ordinance passed in 2014. We've seen 200 or so accessory dwelling units built. That we do have an occupancy requirement or a rental housing, you know, 
restriction on our ADU. So that severely limited the implementation of that policy that will now be lifted in the, in the comprehensive plan. But um, I, so yeah, I think we'll see much quicker growth in multifamily housing along transit than we will in the single family neighborhoods. So in a nutshell, uh, it's gonna be slow. Uh, one of the things that does help was uh, staff definitely listened to the home builders of the legislature. Uh, townhomes weren't originally included in the definition of middle housing, but they were included, and that's good for both what Habitat's building and for what a lot of the, the private market's building um, when they can do kind of fee simple lots. So that was really helpful, um, but it all really hinges on uh, cities' adoption of their codes. And remember, I uh, threw a lot at you. Um, the dupl duplexes are legalized on every lot where a single dwelling home is allowed in cities over 10,000 people. The other middle housing types are legalized in areas and they cannot have kind of undue restrictions. And so there are going to be some legal fights fought about those terms. And it's going to be interesting again to see what the model code ends up being, how many cities try to beat it, how many cities really go for it and try to write a really good um, middle housing code. So there's a lot of variation there and there's a lot we just don't know. Uh, but regardless, it's going to be gradual change over time. And Sightline, uh, my same colleague has actually published an article to that effect. Um, it's on the Sightline website, sightline.org. Um, and it's, it's a good explanation of modeling in one neighborhood, his neighborhood, what, what's happened over the past 30 years where these housing types have been legal. And some of it's just knowledge. I think builders don't necessarily, right, because you can't build them most places. But it has been gradual. And so on that note, there is another little important piece. There was a companion bill that was also passed this session, HB 2003, um, and that directs our state economists to conduct regional housing needs analyses and then set 20-year production goals. And so that's still in the works right now too, um, but that's hopefully gonna tie some of this to uh, fiscal carrots and sticks, and we are excited to see what that's gonna look like. Um, so I think Lawrence on the aisle had a question. Gallup just did a poll about school segregation, and they found that, uh, I know school segregation has nothing to do with housing, but um, <laughs> they found that a majority of Americans recognize school segregation as a problem and want the federal government to take more action. Two-thirds of respondents said they favored putting more low-income housing in high-income areas, and a majority of people said they were okay with redrawing school boundaries to deal with it. And you wouldn't know that from the meetings. Right, but the meetings are what come to represent public opinion about this. So I'm just wondering in all your capacities whether you look for data and ever find it to find a mandate for the kind of things that you want to do. We do. Uh, part of our mission with Arlington County government is uh, we perform the, the, the research function and we work very closely with Arlington Public Schools on uh, student projections, student uh, uh, generation rates. Uh, and so uh, we have that connection with uh, the school board. Uh, the school board just went through uh, a major uh, school boundary uh, set of uh, considerations that uh, were challenging. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, so I, I, I think we are, and for many years, the, the, the connection, I think, between uh, Arlington Public Schools and Arlington County were there, but they needed to be strengthened. And so that's something we're working on. Uh, we uh, you know, have, one of, we have a nationally recognized school system that's just outstanding. We invest significant capital dollars every year on, on new school construction. Uh, and... Uh, uh, the relationship between uh, Arlington schools uh, and the affordable housing, uh, uh, the connection there between schools and affordable housing is one that's part of housing Arlington. And can we find some different ways to, uh, uh, that some communities have done this, but find some different ways to uh, integrate housing with school production and uh, 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 so it, it's it, it's 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 challenging. Some of it's the politics, some of it's uh, economics, uh, and some of it's uh, community-based. But uh, it's something that uh, we need to continue to press on. 
Our school district is also now undergoing a comprehensive plan redo for the district. Our district is struggling. 40% of students in the district don't attend, um, don't go to school in the district. And so we're at a point of financial, sort of at a financial breaking point as a district. There are high transportation costs like in a lot of cities. And I think the city, I think it's fair to say that over time, the city has been moving away from you know, 100% choice, like any school you want to go to, to really gradually more encouraging folks to go to their community schools. My, my kids are in kindergarten and third grade in the district. Um, I think, you know, school conversations are emotional and disruptive for all communities. Like I talked about earlier with housing, it's, you know, when your kid's in third grade, you know, do they want to switch school? You know, it's it, for anyone, for any family. And so I think there's the theoretical value of, of integration. Um, and then there is like whichever neighborhood you live in and whichever school your kid goes to, like you're tied to that community in an emotional way. Um, so change is hard for everyone. And I don't envy the school board members, but we are talking uh, a lot with our school board members, our park board. The, um, we have an independently elected park board as well. The city council members and our staff are talking. We have a program targeted at housing stability for kids in our schools. So we're doing our best to partner at the policymaker level. But it's, yeah. Questions. Um, schools, yes. Schools might be more emotional than parking. Saying something. Hi there. Um, this is, uh, I think, directed more um, towards Lisa and, and Madeline. But we heard from Ingrid earlier about uh, how supply. You know, we can't really um, build more supply and really hit the lowest income households. So I wondered if you guys in your campaigns are thinking about um, partnering with your local housing authorities to maybe encourage them to provide set-asides with vouchers to try and um, get some of your developers to reach the lower income households in terms of some new development and, and also um, reaching out at the federal level to advocate for an increase in federal subsidy, which I know is a very difficult thing to do, but uh, maybe you're just focused more on the near term and that's a long-term plan, but just wanted to hear a little bit about that. I can speak just from an, an advocacy perspective into some things that um, Portland is trying, then we'll see kind of how they work on more of a zoning and planning and supply front. Uh, we just we need the federal government to get back in the housing game, <laughs> like in a major way. It's when you're talking about you know 30 percent and below, and when you're talking about supportive housing, we need more resources, and we need them yesterday, and we need them for the past 30 years. Like that's 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 where that really lies. You're not going to get at that problem without prioritizing it and funding it nationally and statewide. There's just there's just no way. Um, Interestingly, though, I think there's a lot going on. Um, there's another, another project, the Multi-Dwelling Zones Project, again, paired with anti-displacement and residential infill. There's an interest, it's both a bonus system and a preservation and transfer of development rights mm -hmm. project that's being explored where there's really deep bonuses for deeply affordable housing. So we kind of have a base, base level new zones that are increasing density, um, bumping up the zoning a little bit, but more form-based. And then um, if a project is either, um, uh, is, uh, so we, our inclusionary zoning is funny because at the state level, we only lifted the ban on inclusionary zoning in 2016. And so we'd had a state level ban on inclusionary zoning. And so that kicks in at 20, 20 units or above for buildings. And so uh, the zoning project is trying to make sure that we don't get a bunch of 19 unit buildings in multi-dwelling zones where it should be in, in higher, but then they can go up if, uh, there is regulated affordable housing, and they can go even higher if you're reaching, you know, 60% or below. So we'll see. There, there are some interesting things that happen though when you try to share affordable housing finance people in the room. Forgive me for botching this explanation, but when you're trying to mix a deeply affordable housing project with federal and LIHTC funds with other sources of funding, and you're trying to have market rate units in the building, it can sometimes just not be feasible. Like you can't put it together and have someone fund your project. Um, so there are things that need to be worked out on a zoning level and on a funding level where we're not kind of shooting ourselves in the foot when we're trying to plan for mixed income communities and get at deeper affordability. There's a lot that doesn't sort of line up there with the funding sources. Um, I also think that uh, transfer development rights for preservation of affordable housing is gonna be really interesting. There's another project that I'm not as familiar with the details of. We have a new light rail coming in in southwest Portland, so there's a huge anti-displacement uh, housing strategy going on before that project 
hits the ground, um, and that's going to be a really, really, really interesting one to track. I, I mean, I feel like it's important to reemphasize. I mean, I was a toddler when the federal government walked away from funding public housing in our country, and we have inherited a complete disaster that can only be solved with significant federal funding. Um, there's absolutely no way that cities of the, a 400,000 population city like Minneapolis can solve for decades of disinvestment. Um, and so we're, I mean, we're all working around the margins, really. And, you know, and, and frankly, at the same time, it wasn't like the federal government said, we're not, we're not, we don't believe in public housing anymore, but we're going to really dramatically increase supply. Most cities at the same time severely restricted supply. So welcome to 2019. You know, and so we are really aggressively pursuing everything we can do to both preserve naturally occurring affordable housing and protect renters. We, have a, we had a long way to go and we have a lot of state law change that needs to be, that is urgent. Um, but we have, we regulate every single rental unit in Minneapolis. So we have a lot of leverage in our, using our licensing authority and how we're regulating rental housing. Um, we have 3,000 evictions a year in Minneapolis. We have 16,000 evictions statewide. Statewide, three-fourths of people who have an eviction filing lose their homes. Um, so there is an absolute tie between evictions and our rising homelessness, which has risen 10% in the last few years, much higher rates of homelessness in the metro than statewide. Um, so you know, we need to talk about how, I mean, and we're talking about spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to shelter people, to build no, new housing, but there's just this torrent of people getting evicted from their homes. Of course, snow is being torn down, um, being flipped. Um, so I'm really passionate about getting to here and stopping that, that current, right? And so we adopted a um, renter first policy that directs our regulatory services department to prioritize the stability of housing for renters in their buildings. We are changing our rental license tiering system that charges more for a tier three property license than a tier one property. And we're going to redo that around incentivizing, keeping people in their homes, right, as a value. We're still working out the details of that. Um, we've already prevented evictions just by having that written policy that's like three pages long that our staff now have to guide their work through just taking some more time to negotiate between a landlord tenant and a relationship when reg service is involved. Um, you know, that's a small thing, but that's a thing that we have 100% control over as a city. We passed a number of ordinances, including a fair chance housing access ordinance that limits look back for eviction history as well as criminal history and um, prohibits landlords from using credit score as a criteria to deny housing. Um, we are also funding legal protection for renters. I would like us to move to a right to counsel. New York City passed right to counsel. Any low income renter in their housing court has a lawyer. Eviction filings dropped 35% immediately just because landlords knew they couldn't use the housing court as a collection agency against low-income renters. Um, and they've seen 80% of folks who are represented in court be able to stay in their homes. Mm -hmm. So we're piloting that. We're seeing similar results, but we're not reaching all of our uh, all of our tenants that are getting evicted. Um, and then there's a whole list of other things we're doing at the local level and that I want to see happen at the state level. But I think, I think having inherited the situation that we're in, you know, I... When, when I talk to folks in cities who are farther along in the progression of their housing market, they tell me they would do literally anything they could to preserve their affordable housing. And so we are studying rent increase caps now. Um, you know, do I think that that like in isolation is like the absolute right strategy for a city? Maybe, maybe not, but in the context that we are in where we have really no other tools that are working effectively, uh, I mean, we're trying other things. We're going to do, you know, the DC right uh, tenant purchase, opportunity to purchase and try to use that to better um, tie folks to our financing that we have available that we're having trouble getting out the door because we can't compete really well in the private market as a, as a preservation buyer, as many of you in the room know, um, and we're just the financer. So... Um, all that to say, we are aggressively pursuing rental protection, NOAA preservation, and I think, we're, I think we need to leave tools on the table that maybe in isolation would seem too over-regulatory, but when we're pay, pairing it with you know, total, invest, total disinvestment from federal and state governments, or you know, moderate investment from state governments, very, very little from the federal, plus like, decades of constrained supply, while we're loosening our market, I think we have to aggressively work to preserve those affordable units. So I want to go ahead maybe and take two or three questions um, and try to do sort of rapid fire answers. There's lots of great info there. Um, uh, so yes, in the back. Oh, hi, I'll go. Um, so 
we heard we've heard a lot today about the difficulty in translating policy tools to a level that your constituents and other audiences can understand. I'm curious, moving one level up, how often the sort of research we heard about in the first panel is a part of the conversation for policymakers, and um, how the people who generate that sort of research can do a better job uh, translating it at that level. So moving out of the shouting match in the um, community meeting to maybe the shouting match in council chambers. <laughs> Well, just back in the sorry, we're going to take three questions. So I think back there. Thanks. Yeah, uh, in lieu of contentious uh, public meetings uh, with the participants who aren't a representative of your constituents, have you considered conducting surveys uh, to inform housing policy um, and then uh, publicize the findings of those surveys in order to justify uh, whatever course of action uh, you take? Okay. Let's take one more question. Evan? Uh, so we talk a lot about sort of uh, citizens or constituents opposing these new zoning measures. But controlling zoning has also historically been a major way for politicians to have power <laughs> and get money and, and generally be corrupt. Of course, not in Minneapolis. <laughs> um, and I'm curious how much of, do you think that's been a part of why it's difficult to get these zoning reforms off the books? Uh, and you know, how does that, can does that sort of just keep politicians from buying in as much as they would have otherwise? So any of you can take any of those questions. You know, I think, I think the, the point about transferring policy to action and the research material we've heard today, and in Arlington, uh, we're fortunate to have uh, George Mason University, uh, Virginia Tech, uh, to work very closely with. Uh, they have partnered with uh, uh, local governments, both Arlington and Alexandria, on a wide range of initiatives. And uh, we're now doing that on the housing front as well. Uh, so I think that's, that, that's critical to have that analytical uh, and uh, fact-based, uh, certainly, uh, component or partnership. And uh, uh, we need to do, do more of it. And yes, we've taken many surveys uh, on a wide range of fronts and uh, utilize those extensively uh, as an element to uh, influence policymakers in the community. Uh, so uh, both of those uh, should be highly effective. On the politician question, uh, influence and, you know, not corruption, but um, a couple of answers to that. I think more, I know that's historically been a thing that's happened. More, more what I see in responding to is just fear and fear of their constituents voting them out because they are angry. And a lot of the opposition that we're talking about, mostly in terms of local reforms, also corresponds to voters. <laughs> and so I think that's kind of more the major issue that I see on a day-to-day -day basis. Also, Portland City Council is, they're all elected at large. There are only five of them. And so that presents its own uh, representation challenges in terms of uh, who, who is represented in our city at all. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think the conclusion from from that piece of the question is what you know. How does what does it take to get political support? Is it, I mean, it's like a trust fall to do things differently. You have to imagine that in four years or three years or two years, folks are going to be there to catch you, right? And um, and that means door knocking. That means going to your neighborhood meetings in your neighborhood and having your council members back. Um, I do think we are in a moment where zoning is cool. Um, not sure how that happened. It doesn't seem like that was the case it's been cool. 20 years ago. I mean, we knew it was cool, but obviously we've all made it cool. So I think, I think we need our academic partners to be writing op-eds in the newspaper and writing, um, you know, public, like ex turning your research into accessible language. I think the community interest and the community knowledge about these general trends is high. And so I think, um, I think the moment is ripe to start to put into the mainstream some of those more complica you know, complicated economic ideas. I couldn't agree with any of that more. And that's one of the things that I think Sightline actually, just to pat us on the back a little bit, Oregon, Washington, Cascadia has been doing pretty well, sightline.org. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll stop there. I'm going to go ahead and put in a little plug for uh, Brookings, which also puts out a series of, we hope, we hope, highly accessible blog posts and research briefs on this issue. Um, 
and for academics in the audience, those of you who write papers on this stuff that has policy implications, write a policy brief, write a three to four page blog post and put it out there. Um, and if you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter. I feel like I have to say one thing to that. So if you have never heard of Wedge Live, at Wedge Live on Twitter, um, this is a perfect example of like a local person who is making zoning cool. So I took office in 2014, this person, my constituent who I'd never met, started tweeting. Now it's this hyper local media empire with t shirts and a cat tour of the neighborhoods I represent. So, folks, 300 people came to walk around one of my neighborhoods to look at cats in the windows of apartment buildings. <laughs> right? So, I mean, it might, that might be different in different neighborhoods. But he, this guy, he tweets, he live tweets neighborhood meetings. He comes to City Hall and watch, or he watches our zoning and planning. And he, but I can walk into a coffee shop in my ward and two 24-year-olds are talking about what they heard on Wedge Live about zoning in Minneapolis. Um, so I think there is a way to make these issues relevant, interesting, funny, um, cool, that, um, that will really help with that underlying question of like, how are we engaging with folks and, and getting the word out? Just to piggyback yes. Ward 10 version. On that on, yeah. a little bit, one thing that I think we did really well, both as Portland for Everyone and Sightline on occasion, is write pieces about pairing a housing need that is going unmet with like a housing type or a housing rule change. So you start to get into the wonk and you have a policy yeah. implication. You go 50% down that road, but you're also telling a human story. And I think because that's why people care. And it's it's okay if, let's say, the residential info project is predominantly going to serve 60 to 80% median family income, first-time homeown homeowners through a first-time home ownership program. That's a really big get in like 90% of the city's residential land. Like that's huge. If we can be doing Doing that across the board and increasing supply, right? Filtering is real. And so I think like what I'm talking about and the ideas that we saw in the first panel where these things come together and we start putting putting that together as a package and, 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 and educating our electeds on that full package of housing solution suites that we need. And we don't just say, well, this won't solve the whole problem. Yes, and you need to be kind of becoming prepared with a little bit of the and. And so I think where we're able to put the policy objective with a community that would benefit from it across the spectrum, I think that's where we're going to start to see wins when we can message that. Basically, we need you to put your academic research into memes so that we can retweet them. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> we're trying. Perfect. <laughs> um, so I think we have time for maybe one last question. If there's something burning that you want to get off your chest before we break. If not, I can ask a question. Um, we've talked a couple of times about specific elected leaders who sort of pick up and carry the torch. So Lisa, both you and the mayor um, sort of embraced this and were out there owning this. Yep. Uh, Madeline, you mentioned uh, uh, Speaker Kotek. And um, in Arlington, I know that Christian Dorsey has been very out front compared to some of the other regional leaders. How important it is, is it to have, you know, in addition to the community engagement and the grassroots support, to have an elected leader who stands up and says the things and, you know, put some of their political capital behind it? It's essential. There's just no question about it. And uh, uh, we're fortunate in Arlington that uh, we have the leadership on our five-member county board who I think are, are uniformly uh, committed to, uh, to uh, addressing this issue. I also think it's very helpful, again, back to the region and back to the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments who worked with the Urban Institute, uh, Urban Land Institute, and a number of other uh, uh, organizations. And COG has really taken a strong leadership. And I think that connection between COG, the region, and the local level is really important. The other thing I'd like to mention, I think the, the council member's point about the connection with the state legislature is, is just critical as well. Leadership at the state level uh, is going to be uh, very important, uh, certainly for Virginia as well as uh, other communities. But that local policymaker uh, commitment is just uh, essential for sound planning, zoning, and the issues we're trying to face. Yeah, and I think you, you have to have elected leaders who can both have that leadership and also bring people with them and who have the political calculus uh, to I make, I make trades, make deals. I don't know half of what actually happened at the legislature behind closed doors, but uh, 
maybe if you come to Yimby Town 2020 in Portland, Oregon on April 2nd through 4th, we could ask her about it. She hasn't, she hasn't said she's going to be there yet, but we're going to try to get her there. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I mean, I think it is essential, but I, I, you know, political leadership only comes when there are folks who are there to support. And I yeah. think that comes from organizing, it comes from getting out and voting, it get, comes from talking to your neighbors, it comes from supporting elected officials while they are taking tough votes. Yeah. And it also comes from, I think, understanding that I am making a political calculation every time I vote. Yeah. And I had to go tell, you know, I had to get seven, 12 votes for everything. And, and there are, so, you know, you might, if you're an economist or you're a political theorist or whatever, you might not agree with exactly what I'm trying to do, but I am negotiating with 420,000 people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's usually a reason. And so there's usually, like I said, multiple paths to getting to a place. I try to handle the politics and have, you know, and have a pretty clear line with department staff that are giving me a technical recommendation, but I have to handle the politics. And sometimes that means doing things in this particular order or doing this before that, or sometimes it means we have to compromise in this way. And, you know, that's just part of the political process. And I think sometimes planners, again, speaking as a planner, uh, we want to say that we're not political. Um, you know, that, that that's not what we do, or I hate politics. Like you can't hate politics and be a planner working in a, in a growing city in, in, in the country right now, in, the, in North America right now. It's just, we are in a political moment. And I think the longevity of these um, coalitions that have been built require us to have a, a political strategy every time. And I think take an action. I'm like watching you like very from afar, and also watching Speaker Kotak and a couple other really effective leaders. It's consistency, right? Honesty, and coming from a place of values. Like there are very deep relationships with longtime housing advocates and experts that have been built year after year after year where those conversations are really meaningful and people can can trust each other to, to move forward in a really uh, in a really just good way. Um, and again, Rich is leading with values. I, that's that's why we all do what we do.